Well, I want you to take your Bibles tonight. Open, please, to 1 John. Uh, go to uh, the New Testament into 1 John. I know we're doing Romans, and we're going to wrap Romans up uh, next year. <laughs> uh, but tonight, I just feel led to just continue on the theme that really we talked about this morning, and that is uh, the theme of love. And I want to talk about uh, love came down. Now, look at 1 John chapter 4, and look down at verse number 7. And he says this, follow along, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And in this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Now, uh, so I want to speak about this idea of love. Again, we are uh, celebrating uh, the birth of our Savior. And uh, as, again, we are, if you're keeping up with Advent, this is the Sunday, the theme that should be love. And so we spoke about it this morning. I want to talk about it tonight. And this is a letter we could say First John is the, the letter that emphasizes greatly this idea of love. Someone said that Paul was the apostle of faith and Peter was the apostle of hope. But John was the apostle of love. Uh, it is uh, the old church father, Jerome, that said that when the apostle John was extremely old and he was weak, he had to be carried into the, to, to the meetings, the fellowship of God's people. And always when he was carried in, he would repeat this phrase, little children, let us love one another. And the disciples, his uh, followers that were there in the church would say to him, finally, they kind of grew weary of hearing that over again. And they would say, why are you always saying the same thing over and over again? Why are you always telling us to love one another? And he would simply say, because we need to love one another. He would just emphasize it. And we see this same kind of repetition here in 1 John. John emphasizes this concept of love. In fact, go back to 1 John chapter 2 and look at verse number 7, what he, what he says. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. And verse 8, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. And that commandment that he's talking about is talking about love. Drop down to verse uh, nine, he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. So John emphasizes in the very beginning of this letter the importance of love. That reveals that you are a child of God. Look in chapter 3. He goes at it again, chapter 3, verse 11, and he says this, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Now he emphasizes, emphasizes it again. And this time he says, let me tell you what love is not. And he gives us an illustration of, of the opposite of love. Sometimes the best way to describe and define something is to tell you what it's not. And John basically does that in chapter 3. Now we come here again to chapter 4. And he's going to emphasize this idea of love. Again, he repeats the imperative to love one another. In fact, he does it three times. Look at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Drop down to verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Drop down to verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. So again, he tells us, to love one another, love one another. He just repeats it and repeats it. Now, this time when he mentions this, uh, not only does he repeat it for the third time, but this time he's going to hit on it longer because this becomes the theme from verse 7 of chapter 4 all the way down to chapter 5, verse number 4. This long section here, he emphasizes once again the importance of us as God's people to love. In fact, he will emphasize in this section here that this is the distinguishing mark of God's people. This is the distinguishing mark of the church in this world, is that we are people of love. And so we need to examine ourselves by this one supreme standard that John gives to us. Are we people who truly love 
one another. Now, the actual letter of 1 John really is a letter that's designed to cause us to do that very thing, that is to examine our own heart. Remember, I, uh, I told you about 1 John before, how that the whole structure of this letter is kind of like, it's kind of circular, whereas Paul might be more logical, line upon line, line upon line. John just kind of keeps coming back around to the same ideas, the same themes over and over again. One is righteousness. How do we know that we're a child of God? Because we practice righteousness. We live a life of practical righteousness. Uh, and then in the other thing that he emphasizes is we believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's our theology, our doctrine that makes us children of God. But then the other distinguishing characteristic that makes us genuine believers, genuine children of God, is this idea of love. A true child of God is going to love the people of God, but he's also going to just love others. Look in chapter again, chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God. And, you know, the thing about John that's very characteristic of his writing is there's no gray areas. You either are or you're not. You either are in the light or you're in the darkness. It's one or the other. You either love God or you love the world. You can't do both. The Bible says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is what? Not in him. And so there's no gray area there. You can't say, well, I've got one foot in the church and one foot in the world. That just simply means you don't love God at all, according to John. You either love God or you love the world. You can't do both. You are either in the light or you're in darkness. You either love your brother or you hate your brother. And if you don't love your brother, then you do not know God. And so John just hammers this idea of us being people of love. This should distinguish us from the world and from those who only confess to be a child of God. A true child of God is someone that practices love. And just as one other thought before we get into the actual outline. You know, this morning I was talking about trying to define love. And a lot of times, again, people try to define it as some kind of an emotion. But in the Bible, love is more than just feelings. It's an action. You know why? Because God commands us to love. We read three times where John gives a command, love one another. You know what, beloved? He's not commanding an emotion there. He's commanding action. You see, love, again, is not just what we feel. It is what we do. And we show love by our actions. And remember this morning we talked about that love is really just uh, putting others ahead of you. It is selflessness. It is sacrificial, selfless acts on the behalf or for the benefit of others. Now, the reason that John commands us so much and the reason this ought to be the thing that characterizes us is because this is the thing that characterizes our master, our savior. This is why Jesus came into the world. Love came down to us, and so therefore it, that love has changed us, and so therefore we reciprocate that love. We show that love because that is who we are when we came to know Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, I just want you to see five ways that love came down to us. And I want you to just see it in this passage of Scripture. It's a long kind of passage, and so I'm just kind of going to give it a kind of in a summary way. But here's the first point. Number one, love came down from God. First, it came down from God. Very basic. Look again in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God. And so John emphasizes the fact that God is the source of love. And again, this is not a primarily a feeling. It involves emotion, but it's far more than that. Let me read you a good quote from Stephen Cole, who said this, at its heart, biblical love is a commitment. Thus, it may be commanded, but it is not a commitment without feeling, but a caring commitment. In other words, biblical love involves delight, not just duty. Also, this caring commitment is not just an attitude, but an action. It shows itself in deeds. Now, again, where does this kind of love come from? It originates in the Father. John's very clear in verse number seven, love is from God. 
uh, you know, before there was us in this world, before creation, there was love. You know why? Because there is perfect love between the members of the Trinity. Now, every once in a while, I hear someone uh, say that the reason God created us is because God was lonely and he wanted companionship. You ever heard that idea? Sometimes I hear people talk about that. God wanted, you know, companionship because he was lonely and he wanted people to love him. You know, that's just a very weak portrayal of Almighty God. Let me tell you something. In the very beginning, before there, we were here and eternity passed, there was perfect love that was shared between the members of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You say, well, then why did God create us? Because really, I think that creation is the overflow of love. It is the overflow of that love that existed already in eternity past. God was in a, a place of perfect blessedness, and by the way, he still is. Don't think you can trouble God. Don't think that you can cause panic in the, in the heaven. God's never up in heaven going, oh, no, what am I going to do now? God is in a position, in a place of perfect blessedness, a place of perfect love. That love existed in the members of the Trinity, and, and creation was the overflow of that beautiful love that existed already in eternity past between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was as if God said, I want to share what we have with others. You know, I kind of, the illustration I use is, here's a family, a husband and wife and children, and this is such a loving family, such a wonderful family. And there's love, real love that exists in that family. And you know what? The father says, you know what? We're having such a wonderful time as a family. You know what? Let's include someone else. Let's adopt a few kids and bring them into this. You see, that's the way I think about creation. Uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had this beautiful love. And they said, you know what? Let's share this. And God created man in his own image. And that definite, and, there, and when it says God created man in his image, there's a lot implied in that. And I'm never in one sermon going to be able to define all of that. But part of what it means to be created in the image of God is that we are relational creatures. And we were made not to be alone, but to enjoy one another, to relate to one another, and to have this relationship of love. So John says, love is of God. God is the creator of it. All, love comes from God. But then here's the next thing. Not only does it originate in the Father, but it operates in the family. Look in verse 8. For he that loveth not knoweth not God. Actually, let me back up to verse 7, the last part of it. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God. Now, born of God, this is the key expression. And John's argument is that the nature of our heavenly Father is passed on to us. When we are born of God, uh, God brings love to us. He, he shares this wonderful love with us. And I know that people who don't know the Lord that are lost, they still have love among one another because they're created in the image of God. But there's something special that happens when a person is born of God. When you're born into the family of God, there is just a love that is supersedes that normal commonplace love that we had before we knew God. You ever experienced that? I would say before I was saved, I, you know, I like people. But, you know, once I got saved, I started to really love people. And I especially love the church of God. I love being in God's house. You know, you know why you're here tonight? Because you just love God's people and you love being in God's house. And that's just something natural. And this is what he's saying here. Look at the word born there. That's a perfect tense Greek word, born of God. Remember what I told you about perfect ten, an action that's completed in the past with continuing results in the present. At one point, we were born into the family of God, and that one individual act, that birth, that supernatural birth, that being born again has had an impact on our life, and we still see the influence and the results of that one thing that's happened in our life. When we were born of God, we suddenly began to love in a different way. And so we have a special love, a love that comes from God. And John says, if you don't have that, you're simply not born of God. It's very simple. You're not 
a child of God. So we can say, number one, love came down from God. But here's the second point. Love came down to earth. It was manifested. Look at verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Look at the word manifest there. It's the Greek word phaneru, or we could say phanos, and it's where we get um, part of the word thane from. And it's actually the word that means to make clear or to make evident or to reveal, to reveal something clearly. Uh, Let me illustrate it to you like this. Many years ago, before there were supermarkets, you had basically your grocer, right? And people would go to their grocer. It was not a very large store, just a, you know, just a small store, and you could buy all your groceries there. And normally the meat was very fresh. Uh, you could see it, and uh, you know, uh, it was, it was uh, something that wasn't really wrapped like we have today in the supermarket. It was just you know, meat that was freshly cut, and people could see what they were buying. But as the supermarkets came, um, and you, they had to be able to keep things fresh for a longer period of time, they would have to wrap that meat. And, you know, there was one thing that was taking place, and that is people didn't normally want to meet, uh, buy meat that they couldn't buy, uh, see with their eyes. They wanted to be able to see what they were buying. So they had to figure out a way to keep that meat fresh and to make it to where people could see what they were buying. And a scientist came up with, an, uh, with something in his lab He used a cellulose fiber, and he found out that he could make a plastic that you could wrap things in, and you know what they they call that? Cello what? Cellophane, which is a clear plastic wrap. And of course, when you go to your supermarket today and you go into the meat section, you're able to see what you're buying because it's wrapped what? In cellophane. And that cellophane clearly reveals what you're getting it keeps it fresh, and it's revealing. And so they, they took this Greek word, phanos, and they added it to the word cellulose, which is how they made it. And you get now cellophane because you can see what you're getting. And that's the word that we see here in the Greek, phanero, which simply means to make clear. You see, if you want to know what God's love is like, it was made evident by Jesus Christ. You might say he was the love of God wrapped in cellophane. That's a, probably shouldn't say that, but you, you get the idea. He was the one that clearly revealed God's love to us. You know, we could talk about God's love, and people before Christ could kind of wrap their mind a bit around what it meant when they said, that, when they said God loved them, but we really didn't truly understand what God's love was like until Christ came. And friend, if you want to know what the love of the Father is, then let, just do this little experiment. Just read the Gospels. Just open your Bible and start reading the Gospels and start reading about the life of Christ. In fact, I would say that of all the things in my Christian life that had an impact on me early on after I was saved, it was when my mother bought me a Bible, and I remember taking that Bible home and reading through as a newborn Christian, reading through the Gospel of Matthew, and being absolutely, totally captivated by the life of Christ. And you know what it was that stood out to me about Jesus? How much he loved people. He was the love of God personified. And this is what John is saying here. Uh, Love came down to earth. It was manifested. And this was manifested, the love of God towards us, that God sent his Son into the world. God became a man and God revealed his love. Let me give you the third thing. Love came from God, uh, came from God. Number two, love came down to earth. It was manifested to us in Christ. But here's the third thing. Love came down to the cross. Now look at verse number 10. He continues, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, here is his love manifested to the next level that not only did he come, but he came to be the propitiation for our sins. He traveled this 
distance to earth for that one reason there, to die, to be the propitiation. Now, a lot of times you'll hear me say this when I'm sharing the gospel, and I'll say that the gospel starts with the what? Oh, you're hurting me. The gospel starts with the holiness of God. Remember, you've heard me say that before, surely. How many remember me saying that? Okay, well, I feel a little better. It starts with the holiness of God. That's where the gospel starts. Because this holy God, because he is a God who is holy, means that he must judge sin, that his wrath must be satisfied. And how can that wrath be satisfied? Well, there's a dilemma that we, I've talked about before. God is a God of love. He doesn't want to punish us, but he's a God who is holy, and his wrath must be satisfied. And it's this, this dilemma, this seeming dilemma, we could say, is resolved in Jesus Christ. And it's in that word propitiation that we see there in verse number 10, because the word propitiation means to, it's a satisfying, to satisfy the Father. This is why Christ came. Christ came to satisfy God the Father. And what did he want to satisfy specifically? This dilemma between the wrath of God, the holiness and wrath of God, and the love of God, both of those things had to be satisfied. There had to be harmony between God's wrath and God's love. And the only way that could happen is there had to be, a, uh, there had to be someone that would be the punishment for sin that would satisfy God's wrath and yet also satisfy his love. That's why Jesus stepped forward all the way back in eternity past to say to the Father, I will go. I will be that, that propitiation. Again, that's what the word here means, a satisfying. I will satisfy the wrath of the Father by being the sin bearer And Jesus took all of our sins upon himself, and God's wrath fell on Jesus, and God's holiness was satisfied. And since God didn't have to punish us, his love was satisfied. And Jesus became that propitiation. And again, that is the love of God. Not that that we love God, but that he loved us. And he loved us so much that he was willing to send his son to satisfy his holy wrath. And when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die for friends. You understand, we weren't his friend. The Bible says that we were his enemies. I know that might be hard for you to comprehend, but the Bible says that those that are lost are in enmity against God. There's a rebellion in their heart against God. You believe that? If you don't believe that lost man has an enmity and a rebellion in his heart against God, just when you're out shopping the next time, just start, start talking about Jesus. See what kind of response you get. Now, there may be a few Christians out there that will rejoice in what you hear. But for the most part, when you start talking about Jesus, people are going to they're gonna, they're gonna clam up. Now, you talk about Santa Claus and you'll have a good conversation. But if you start talking about Jesus and for the why he came, you'll see that natural hostility that is in man. And the Bible tells us that we were at enmity with God before salvation. So when Jesus died for us, he didn't die for friends. He died for enemies. And that's just amazing when you think about it. So we see Christ's supreme act, that he be the propitiation for our sin, the supreme role where the Bible says that um, he was the was the only begotten of the Father. Um, Christ was the only begotten. Uh, Look in verse 9. And this was manifest the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten Son. And with this is the Greek word monogenes. And what does this mean? This refers not to Christ's birth or his humanness. It just simply means he was the supreme one. There was no one greater than Jesus. And so this was his role, and we see his supreme sacrifice, that he would be the propitiation for our sins. Just an incredible thing when you think about it. 
Uh, D, D. James Kennedy loves to tell the story. He's in heaven now. But he would tell the story of a man by the name of John Griffin from Oklahoma, who during the, the uh, Great Depression and the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma moved his family to uh, the Mississippi. And they, there he got a job as a, a, a train bridge operator. His whole job was to sit at a, at a train booth and he would throw a lever and the bridge would come down and the train would go across safely the river on the bridge that would come down. And then when a boat would come by, he would throw the lever and pull the bridge up. And D. James Kennedy tells the story of this man one day who brought his eight-year-old son to work with them. And something terrible happened during that day where he lost track of where his son was. And suddenly he heard the train whistle in the distance. There was the 407 from Memphis ready to pass through. The, the bridge needed to come down. But he looked around for his son instinctively and found that his son was playing right there among the, those gears. That if he hit the lever, those gears would come to, together and would crush the body of his son. And he was just horrified, you can imagine, if you were in that situation. He looked at the time. He saw the train coming the distance down to try, if he would try to run and grab his son and bring him back, he knew it was impossible. There was no way that he could save his son unless he refused to throw that lever and let the bridge stay up. But if he did that, there were 400 people on that train that would perish, surely perish, with that train running off into the river. So in that split-second moment, he had a decision to make. My son or the people on that train? Which one would he choose? And he reached out and he threw the lever and took the life of his only son. And sure enough, the bridge lowered and the train came by. He sat there in his station, looked into the windows of that train as it went by. There was a man reading the newspaper. There was a child playing in the aisle. There was a man smoking a pipe. There were two women that were talking. There were others that were eating in the dining car. And as they went by, the thought came into the heart of this man. Those people on that train have no idea of the price that was just paid to save their life. No idea. What a picture of the world today. This world basically will, you know, Christmas will come and people will exchange gifts and they'll have their fun. And somehow they'll be blinded to the idea that Christ came for them. And they will have no idea of the price that God paid to send his son for them. And they'll be oblivious to that. Uh, what an incredible thing that God did when he sent his son, Jesus, for us. Love came down from God. Love came down to the earth. Love came down to the cross where Jesus became the propitiation for our sins, where God sent his son into the world to do that very thing. And then here's number four. Love came down to us. Look at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now, this is you, you, you follow the logic of John here. You follow his argument. And this is why he commands us over and over again in this letter to love one another. Why? It's based on this one idea that God so loved us to the degree that he would send his son. And if God truly loved us to that degree, then we ought to look at the word ought there. This implies obligation or command. This is why we should love others. Because God so loved us, came down to us. And then here's the fifth point and final point. Let's say it like this. Love came down to us by the Spirit. And so look in verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And you can see the, the next idea in John's argument is that if this world today is going to see lo the love of God, how are they going to see it? they got to see it in us. The world can't see Christ today. Jesus ascended into heaven. 
No one has seen God, John said, at any time. And what he means by that is no one has seen the full, real manifestation of God. Now, we know that people in the Old Testament have glimpses of God. When God put Moses in the cleft of the rock and passed by and Moses saw the afterglow, Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne, but he didn't see God in his full manifested glory because the Bible says that no man can really see God and live. And so really there's a sense in which no man has really seen the full unadulterated presence of God. It's always been veiled in some way. But here's his point. If people want to see God today, they're not going to be able to go to heaven and look in his throne room. If they see God today, they're going to see it in you. They're going to see it in the church. And how will they see it? They'll see it in the love that we have, uh, the love that dwells in us. If we love one another, this is, the way the, this is the way the world sees love. They see it in us as we love each other and as we love them. And this is, John says, this is how the love of God is perfected. Look at the word perfect, perfected there in verse 12. This is the Greek word teleos. It has the idea not of sinlessness, but rather completion or maturity or something that comes to, to, to ripeness. It's like when a fruit becomes fully ripe. At the peak of ripeness, at the fullness of maturity. That's the idea here. God's love comes in the full bloom in us. And people can see it in us. That's the idea. You say, well, how can God's love be perfected in us? Well, the good news is this is why God has given us the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How do we see God's love perfected in us? Well, it's through we experience the, us experiencing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Look in verse 13. Hereby we know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And where it says of his spirit, the Greek actually means out of his spirit. And in other words, the whole idea is out of his Holy Spirit, he gives us this ability to show God's love to the world in a mature ripen sense, he works through us so that people are able to see the love of God. And by seeing that, uh, they see God in a sense in us. They see it in us. I don't know about you, but I want people to see Christ in me. I want people to see the true love of Christ in me. I want them to see it in our church. I want them to see it in you everywhere we go. If they're going to see it, it has to be in us. And so John says, you know, we experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We become bold witnesses of Christ. Look at verse 14. For we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. This is another way in which the world sees the love of God in us because we become bold witnesses for Christ. We share Christ wherever we go. Um, and this is the whole idea here. This is what the Holy Spirit does in us. We go out and we tell others about this wonderful Savior. Someone said that the gospel in the first century had a good, it was carried by a good system. It was not telegram or telephone or television. It was teleperson. That's the best way to carry the gospel is by telling another person about the Lord Jesus Christ. We experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's how the love of God is perfected. It's perfected when we become bold witnesses for Christ. Look at verse 15. And whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. You know what that means? We're not ashamed of Christ. We're willing to tell Christ. We do not sacrifice the truth for love. We, we talk about Jesus wherever we go. Uh, we proclaim him. But also, we know experientially God's love for us. Look at verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in God, uh, love dwelleth in God, and God in him. And what John is saying is, we know this experientially. We know the love of God in us, and this is why we're able to communicate it so freely to others, because we have experienced this love. And then here's the next thing. Again, I had to go through this kind of in a survey Form, but we have no fear of judgment, verse 17 and 18. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment, 
And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. So if we're perfecting God's love and demonstrating this love to others around us, you know what will happen? When a time of judgment comes, we won't be afraid. We won't be afraid of the judgment because this, this perfect love will cast out fears. In other words, we're living like Jesus did. We're manifesting God's love into this world. And this Christ-likeness that we see in our life, this will give us confidence in the day of judgment. And let me just say this, and we're almost done. Sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, you know, I'm doubting my salvation. Am I a Christian? You know what they want? They want me to give the official approval that they are saved. I, I, sometimes I don't know what they're asking me for because let me just tell you, beloved, I don't have the authority to say, oh, yes, you are saved. I don't have the authority to do that. I can't do that. The assurance that you get that you're a child of God must come from the Holy Spirit. I can't give it to you. I can point you to the way. I can point you to what the Scripture says, but you have to find it yourself. But let me just say this. When, when I believe, and by the way, there are times when I believe true Christians, when they'll come to me and they'll, they're doubting, I believe they're truly saved. I really do. I can see Christ in them, but I'm not about to tell them that because, again, they have to find it on their own. But you know when a person goes through a doubts about their salvation, you know when they doubt the assurance is when they're not doing these things. When they are not really living like Jesus, when they're living a disobedient life, when they're not really manifesting God's love to others, when they're living more for themselves, when they're not being bold witnesses for Christ, they kind of back away from that. Perhaps a believer gets to the point to where they don't want to bear the reproach of the gospel, and so they, they are silent. And they kind of just mingle in the world. And they're, not, they're not living for God actively. They're not obeying the Lord. And then, you know, when a person gets to that stage in their spiritual life, it's very natural for doubts to come in, doubts about salvation to happen. But John is saying this, look, if you're living the way God has called you to live, and you're really loving others. And remember we said love is not a feeling. It's what? It's actions. It's what you do. If you're showing your love to God and your love to others, then what that's going to do is that's going to give you confidence that you are a child of God and you will have no fear when judgment comes because love perfected in your life, love that is, that is seen, it's coming to maturity, full fruition, casts out fear cast out the fear that maybe I'm not a child of God. That is cast aside when you love the way God has called us to do. And then here's the last sub point. We reciprocate God's love. We love him because he first loved us. Actually, this is the last sub point. I, I told you wrong. We love, uh, we show love for our God by loving our brother. We show love for our God by loving our brother and this is verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loved God loved his brother also. And so it's very simple. You're going to love your brother simply because uh, he's of God as well. Um, you're going to love all those that are born of God. And so John is showing us here what it means when we say when love came down. It came down from God. It came down to earth. Love came down to the cross. Love came down to us. Love came down to us by the Holy Spirit. It's through the Holy Spirit that this kind of love is perfected in us. Let's bow for prayer tonight. Let's bow for prayer. And I pray that God has used his word to speak to your heart. I know he's used it to speak to mine and to remind me of things that I have known, but I need to hear again in my own walk with him. And my prayer tonight, beloved, is that I will have the love of God perfected, come to full maturity in me through the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I, I ought to love others, and we all ought to love others because of the tremendous way in which Christ has loved us.
And that's really the whole message that John gives us here. And would you just take a moment there with your head bowed and your eyes closed, and would you just pray that God would help you to practice this type of love, to see the love of God perfected in your own life? Take a moment again and contemplate God's love for you. And then ask God to help you perfect that love to others. Father, thank you again how powerful your word is, Lord, and how it convicts us. Lord, may we not just listen and forget what we hear. Lord, help us to apply it, to live it out. For your glory's sake, we pray in Jesus' name.